So in this first lecture after the introduction, I would like to take up the history of international politics. That combines international politics, the first of the three main plays which take place on the IR stage, with history, the first of the common threads, which cut across all the plays and plots. Before coming to the main topic, let's take a moment to consider what history is. In my actual class, I ask my students the simple question, do you like history or not? Their answers have varied over the years, but on the whole, I get about the same number of yes and no's. Those who answered no either confess their indifference to the subject or otherwise cite their experience at school where they were more or less forced to memorize the dates, a rather tiresome assignment. I didn't like history at all for the same reason. Those who said they liked history refer to the excitement of learning of old times and of foreign lands, and also of reading the story of historical figures whom they can sympathize with and even identify with. That's quite understandable too. It gives us a lot to learn about life and human nature. That side of history, I would say, belongs to the humanities. But those are not the only reasons why history can be so interesting and so important. In this class, we will be concerned more of history as a social science. History as a social science is more than anything else about causality. Cause and effect in history, or in social relations more generally, can be observed and discussed at many different levels. Why a certain person did what, when, and where may be a question at a micro level whereas causality at an aggregated macro level can be altogether a different story. Seen in its totality, history is a phenomenally complex process, full of chance, contingency, and disjunctures. And yet we may be able to uncover certain structures and laws which govern that huge process. We will look at history in that sense. And to take you one step further along that perspective, I can do no better than to cite E. H. Carr from his famous book, What is History? E. H. Carr was a British diplomat and political scientist who became an eminent historian. One of his seminal works was this book, What is History?, which he published in 1961. In it, among other erudite thoughts on the subject, he described history as an unending dialogue between the present and the past. What he meant was, that every history consists of a dialogue between the historian, who represents the present, and the historical facts or events from the past that the historian decides to take up, study, analyze, and evaluate. Through that process, the historian appraises the present in light of the past and contemplates the past according to present yardsticks. That exercise, says E. H. Carr, cannot be entirely objective. Necessarily, judgments are made when choosing the historical event or events to be examined in the first place, and there are an infinite number of areas and events to choose from. Once a choice is made, then comes a question of what importance or significance to give to each event as opposed to the others, whether to focus more on the political and economic trends and leaders of the time, as many historians tend to do, or to pay more attention to the social and cultural dimensions of history, to the implications of geography, ecology, and the psychology of the general masses of people, etc., etc. That's very much a matter for a value judgment by the historian. And no two historians will have exactly the same set of values and priorities, or indeed the same sense of purpose. And then what the historian undertakes to do is to look into the causation in the event that she or he has chosen to study. E. H. Carr devotes one of the chapters in What is History to this very topic. It's chapter four on causality in history. In that chapter, he illustrates his point using some anecdotes. One of them is an imagined incident, which goes like this short video clip. So as you can see, this man who was crossing the road was knocked down by a car. The man who was knocked down was a certain Mr. Robinson, and the man who was driving the car was a certain Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones was on his way back home from a party where he obviously had a lot of drinks. 
And it also happened that the brakes of his cars were defective. Added to that, this corner that he had just come round was a blind corner with poor visibility. While Mr. Robinson happened to be crossing this road at the time was that he was a heavy smoker and he had just realized he had run out of cigarettes that day and that was why he came out to buy some cigarettes. Now the question to be asked here is what was the real cause or what were the main causes of this accident? Was it the defective car? Was it the fact that Jones was drunk or was it the blind corner? Or was it indeed the fact that Robinson was a smoker? The correct answer to this question will be drawn from making clear what our objective is in asking these causes. What is the end to which we establish the real causes of the incident so that we may be able to take measures to prevent the recurrence of these kind of accidents? Obviously, no one in his right mind will propose to put a restriction on smoking in order to prevent traffic accidents. So the point that E.H. Carr makes here is the importance for historians to establish what the real causes are. And those are causes which can be generalized with the purpose of serving an end. And that's what we'd like to keep in mind when studying history. So coming to today's subject, the history of international politics. In other words, the history of the political relations between nations or states. Of the many approaches to history on a global scale, this is perhaps the most orthodox and mainstream approach. In itself, it is a vast area to look at. Here, let us take a bird's eye view, focusing on the major events. In terms of the timeline, we shall look at roughly the last 500 years. In terms of geographical reach, we shall start from the Europe of around 500 years ago. Why 500 years ago? And why only Europe? Of course, there had been states and political relations between them from well before that time. And certainly this was not confined to Europe. However, it was in Europe around that time that the modern form of the nation state emerged. The concept of the nation state was established at the time of the Peace of Westphalia, which is the collective name for the treaties which ended the Thirty Years War. Thereafter, it became the standard form of state throughout Europe and then gradually throughout the world. So Europe of that period was where the shape or system of the international society, which continues to this day, first took root. It should be noted that the defining feature of the nation state is that it is sovereign, which means that in the international society, there is no higher authority above the state. There is no single definition of the nation state. My take would be that a nation state is a polity or political unit which exerts exclusive power over an identified territory and people of a common or assimilated ethnicity. Let me now run you through this chart, a brief history of modern international order which is a real bird's eye view of the past five centuries showing only the truly momentous events the major political systems which emerged and evolved, the major powers or the most powerful states of each century, and the main political principles which guided international relations. As I already mentioned, the first prototypes of a nation state appeared in the 16th century. Spain was one of them. The Holy Roman Empire was still a powerful political entity, but it was not a nation state. It was a confederation of territories where the authority of the emperor, who was supposed to preside over all the territories, tended to be thwarted by the autonomy of each territorial leader and by the papacy in Rome. By the 16th century, the political power of the Catholic Church declined, and by the 17th century, the system of nation states in Europe was more or less set in stone. They were all led by absolute monarchs, who took over from ecclesiasticism and feudalism. From then on, it seems that a certain pattern emerged in the way major events unfolded. I believe I have chosen these events in a not entirely arbitrary fashion. Most historians, I think, will agree that the events which have had an overwhelming impact on the history of international politics were wars. That indeed was a feature of international relations from well before, 
But what marks the last five centuries is that at certain intervals, an all-out major war broke out, which involved all or almost all of the major powers which formed this system of nation states at the time. They led to catastrophic consequences. And in the aftermath, a major peace conference or conferences of a game-changing nature was held by a group of several victorious nations, which laid the foundation for a new system for peace in a new political landscape. In my reckoning, there were four such wars. First, the Thirty Years' War, which was a religious struggle between the Catholics and Protestants, but it also set many of the states against each other in a political conflict. It was one of the most destructive wars in European history. After lengthy negotiations, the war was ended by peace treaties, which were signed in the Westphalian region, which is in present day Germany. These treaties are considered to have more or less settled the religious disputes and are also seen by many as having marked the origin of a modern international system based on sovereign states. The major powers involved were the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, France, Sweden, and the Netherlands. The Peace of Westphalia brought forth a relatively stable period of peace in Europe. Although many small and not so small wars continued to occur, no major upheaval involving the whole of Europe took place until in 1789 the French Revolution erupted. As is well known, the French Revolution had a profound impact, not just inside of, but also outside of France. It sent shockwaves throughout Europe, where the sudden surge of republicanism that it represented was seen as a serious threat to monarchism, the foundation on which the Peace of Westphalia was constructed. What ensued after the French Revolution was a period of tumult and disorder. Internally in France, but also internationally between on the one hand republicanism or rule by the bourgeoisie and on the other hand absolute monarchism represented by the old regimes of Europe who were not going to give in easily. It was a major period of transition from one predominant political system to the next involving a lot of strife and destruction. Amidst that confusion emerged Napoleon he was not of hereditary descent, therefore not a monarchy, but nonetheless came to assume dominant power, crowned himself emperor of France, and set out to conquer Europe. He was a unique figure who stood at the crossroads of the major historical transition. Ostensibly, his rule initiated what is called constitutional monarchy, a compromise form, if you like, of political rule between monarchism and republicanism. That tradition continues to this day. You might say that Japan and Russia of today are in their rather different ways, both constitutional monarchies. In any case, the emergence of Napoleon created great tension in Europe. It led to an all out war between France and a coalition of the other major powers led mainly by Britain. The war continued until the war continued until Napoleon's final defeat in 1815. So as a consequence of the French Revolution, Europe was in turmoil for more or less two decades with the French Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars. For the sake of convenience, I've combined them in this chart, calling it the 20 Years' War. What took place afterwards was, sure enough, a series of conferences held between 1814 to 1815 led by the major victors, Britain, Austria, Prussia, which is more or less present day Germany, and Russia. France also participated. It is collectively called the Congress of Vienna, where they settled the outstanding issues and reorganized Europe in a way which was naturally in favor of the old regimes. Significantly, it was designed to maintain a balance of power so that Europe could remain in peace. The most powerful nation at the time, Great Britain, opted to be the balancer. It would not associate itself permanently with any of the other powers, but instead would throw its weight at one time on one side and at another time on another side, thereby maintaining the balance and hence stability and peace. This system worked by and large for about 100 years, which was a period of relative peace in the sense that no global war took place. 
numerous small and not so small wars, as well as further revolutions like these two in France continued to occur. The system was not to last indefinitely. While the leaders of the major powers would meet on and off to deal with conflicts of interest, no permanent institution with an organized agenda to prevent war was put in place. The political balance in Europe gradually shifted with the unification of Germany and of Italy. From around the 1870s, imperialism, a new guiding principle in international relations started to take root. The overriding concern of imperialist states was the expansion of their spheres of influence and economic interests by way of territorial conquest. Almost all the major powers fell into this mode of behavior in the 19th century, thereby undermining the foundations of the peace which was achieved at Vienna. And now we come to the two great wars of the 20th century, the First and Second World Wars. These two wars were altogether on another scale from any of the previous wars in history. They were in a class of their own in terms of the level of destruction, number of deaths and casualties, and in their global reach. And the second was even worse than the first. Let's look quickly at what these two wars had in common that make them stand out. First, they were total wars. What that means is they were not just unprecedented in their magnitude, but that they involved everybody, not just the politicians, the diplomats and soldiers, as was the case with all traditional wars up till then, but also civilians, including women and children, and they all had to suffer terribly. According to some estimates, 40 million people died altogether worldwide in the First World War, and up to 80 million people in World War II. Many of them were civilians. All main industries were mobilized for the singular purpose of fighting the war. In short, they were all out struggles between the nation states. Also, we mustn't forget that in the Second World War, humankind experienced new heights of inhumanity and destruction with the Holocaust and with the use of atomic bombs. Second, to make a long story short, the two great wars essentially came of imperialism of the unabashed pursuit of national interest by the imperialistic powers. Both world wars resulted basically from a challenge by the newcomers to the scene of imperialism. Germany in particular, and also Japan in the case of World War II, against the old hands led by Britain and France. The thrust of imperialism, which was backed up by the new economic and technological advances brought forth by the Industrial Revolution, was so powerful that it took the two great wars and their dire consequences to finally put an end, at least in theory, to the infamous political system. Third, East-West linkages. This is what truly distinguishes the two great wars from the other wars. They transcended the two great oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic. That was particularly so with the Second World War, in which almost all the major nation-states of the world, not just Europe, the US and Japan, were implicated in one way or other. Let me illustrate this point with two maps, one each for the two world wars. This map of Europe in 1914, the eve of World War I, shows how the major imperialist powers were facing off each other. The situation was so precarious that many assumed that a clash was inevitable. All that was needed was an incident to ignite the powder keg, as the Balkans were called in those days. Tension was growing between the Habsburg Empire, Austria-Hungary, and Serbia, which was backed by Russia, the old rival of Austria-Hungary. Both had held imperialistic designs on the peninsula. And so in June that year, as the textbooks tell us, the Prince of Austria-Hungary and his wife were shot dead by a young Bosnian Serb during their visit to Sarajevo. This led Austria-Hungary to declare war against Serbia, whom they held responsible for the assassination. That in turn meant the other major wars more or less entering the war under obligation to their coalition partners of the Triple Entente, Russia, France and Great Britain, and the Triple Alliance, Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy. That far, the war was confined to Europe. However, the Triple Entente was later on reinforced by a number of countries, including the United States and Japan from outside of Europe. 
So how did Japan, which had no vital interest in Europe at the time, get involved in World War I? It was on account of the Anglo-Japanese alliance. First signed in 1902, it was the first alliance on equal terms between East and West. Although Japan and Britain are geographically distant, they found it in their common interest to join forces against Russia, with which they were facing off on their respective home grounds. Japan, in fact, entered into a war with Russia in 1904. Britain remained neutral, but provided de facto support to Japan, which in the event managed to win the war. Let's now look at this situation from the point of view of the French. France at the time was in alliance with Russia, but out of fear of antagonizing Britain, her more important ally, could not intervene in favor of Russia. The overriding concern for France was to prepare for an impending clash with Germany, her arch enemy, by consolidating the Triple Entente. That required a conciliation between Britain and Russia. Britain was prepared to take that step, but the enmity between Russia and Japan, an ally of Britain, stood in the way. Therefore, when the Russo-Japanese War ended, France and Britain intervened to urge a reconciliation between Japan and Russia, which they duly obliged with an agreement for cooperation in 1907, the same year that Britain and Russia also formed an alliance. So a firm coalition was established on the European front against Germany and Austria-Hungary, thereby linking East and West. This next map shows how the bulk of the world was split into two camps in January 1941, in the early stages of World War II. The Allied nations are in black and their occupied territories in gray. The Axis nations are in red and the territories they occupied are in pink. The war had broken out in Europe, but not yet in the Pacific. You can see that a large part of Europe was falling under the rule of Nazi Germany. Britain was hanging on, but only just. They badly needed backing by the United States, who were providing support to Britain, but was still staying out of the war itself. The United States was preparing for war, but that was not so much to help Europe as to defend U.S. interests in the Asia-Pacific against Japan's aggression. Britain and France also shared that interest, but they were much too preoccupied with their home ground. The U.S. being a democracy, it took President Roosevelt a while before he could get his nation to endorse his plan to turn from isolation to intervention. The final straw was Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Only then the U.S. formally entered into war with Japan, and that in turn meant the U.S. also entering into war with Japan's allies in Europe, Germany and Italy. So the tide turned, and Europe was eventually saved from Nazi domination. Here, East and West were indeed very critically interlinked. World War II was a truly global war. As we've seen, the participation of the U.S. was a decisive factor in both world wars. In both cases, the camp with which the U.S. sided came out as the victors. The First World War was mainly fought in Europe, whereas in World War II, the Asia-Pacific became another center of gravity. The United States sits between those two regions, separated by the two great oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic. Traditionally, that meant a strong inclination of the U.S. to stay isolated. However, by the time of the Second World War, the U.S. had vital interests to defend in both regions. So with the Second World War spanning both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, the U.S.'s role became all the more pivotal. Another critical factor in the two world wars was propaganda. In other words, the dissemination of information to promote a political agenda. Propaganda has always been employed by nation states as a key tool to further their goals, particularly in times of international conflict. By that very nature, propaganda is usually biased and designed to mislead. It has been said that the first victim of a declaration of war is the truth. The importance of propaganda reached a new level during the two world wars. Propaganda, or more to the point, the manipulation of public opinion, is an essential prerequisite for the conduct of war, for the simple reason that in democracies, 
most countries nowadays are supposed to be democracies, the public needs to be convinced before any war can be waged. Not an easy task for governments. The task gets even tougher once a total war is entered into. Not just the soldiers, but the whole nation requires constant rousing in order to keep up the effort. Last but not least, the two world wars were followed by major conferences. Those conferences were held first of all in order to put an end to the war, settle the outstanding issues, and to draw the post war political map, which usually meant territorial and other gains for the winners and losses for the losers. As we've seen, that took place after the Thirty Years' War and the Twenty Years' War as well. What was different with the two world wars of the 20th century was in addition to those purposes, the conferences took on a new dimension, namely to construct a world war system for peace. After the First World War, this ambitious undertaking was centered around one major conference, which was held at the Palace of Versailles, just outside of Paris. It was dominated by three of the victorious nations, the US, UK, and France. The US president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, who was a former Princeton professor, had his designs for a new system of peace. Much of his liberal ideals, including national self-determination, open diplomacy, free trade, freedom of the seas, etc., were still rather ahead of the times that they met resistance from the traditional powers. They, however, reached an agreement and signed a treaty to set up the League of Nations, which was Wilson's main proposal. The post-World War I system, with the League of Nations as its centerpiece, is commonly called the Versailles system for peace. The League, however, was doomed to failure when the United States Senate refused to ratify the treaty, thereby rendering the League severely hampered by the absence of the most powerful nation, the United States. Among other factors which led to the collapse of the Versailles system of peace, the fundamental structural cause lied in the advent of the new political forces. Fascisms in Germany and Italy, Japanese imperialism, communism of the Soviet Union, and finally the rise of national self-determinism in Asia. Among these four new forces which all threatened the established order, it was the latter two, and in particular communism, which was feared the most by the US, Britain and France. The expansion of Germany and Japan during the interwar period, insofar as they were bulwarks against communism, were tolerated to an extent that in due course they became difficult to contain. That was the essential failing of the system. There were of course other factors too, notably the Great Depression of 1929, which led to protectionist trade policies, which in turn contributed to the deterioration of political relations. In the event, the Peace of Versailles only lasted 20 years. So let's put ourselves for a moment in the shoes of Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and other Allied leaders during World War II. Their main preoccupation was, of course, first of all to win the war, but as it became clear that they were going to win, their attention shifted towards, for one thing, how they would face off with each other after the war, particularly with the Soviet Union. Their other major preoccupation, which had an even more profound and longer-term implication, was once again the post-war system for peace to be constructed. They were much more thorough in their approach than at the time of World War I, as you can see here in the sheer number of related conferences which took place. Given the devastating impacts of the Second World War, they could not afford to fail this time. Firstly, the conferences of various forms to end the war extended from 1943 through 1951. The series of meetings at a high level to discuss the post-war system goes back to as early as 1941. We shall name that system the San Francisco System for Peace, for no other reason than the fact that two important conferences of a different nature but nonetheless within the broad framework, happened to take place in San Francisco, one in 1945 and the other in 1951. The San Francisco system for peace was unprecedented in its breadth. It covered not just agreements and institutions for the political and military realms, but also a range of organizations for international economic cooperation. And it did not stop there. 
the founding fathers of the system felt that there was yet another dimension that had to be addressed in a truly lasting system for peace. That was the realm of the human mind. So a conference was convened in London in November 1945, where they adopted the constitution of UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. In its preamble, you will find a lofty ideal inscribed. Since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. To what extent that ideal of the third pillar for peace has since been honored is very much a mixed story. I would just point out that UNESCO's programs, which are meant to be in areas removed from politics, nonetheless often tend to be politicized. As a consequence of that and other reasons, the organization has suffered from the withdrawal of the United States, once from 1984 to 2003, and now again since 2018. As for the first pillar for peace, the architects of the San Francisco system took special care so as not to repeat the failure of the League of Nations. In April 1945, 50 nations gathered in San Francisco to set up the United Nations. One of the main organs of the organization, the Security Council, which consists of 15 member states, including five permanent members, Was given special powers to fulfill the UN's primary objective of maintaining international peace and security. The track record of the Security Council is again a mixed story. It has often f e l l into paralysis due to the veto power given to the five permanent members the US, the Soviet Union, now Russia, the UK, France, and China. Initially, the Republic of China, later on, the People's Republic of China. At least the UN has not so far suffered a withdrawal by any of the member states. In that sense, it is a universal organization. We should also not underestimate the important role played over the years by the numerous PKOs, the peacekeeping operations, an ingenious invention which was not foreseen in the original text of the UN Charter. Now, over 75 years since the end of the Second World War, The world has seen enormous change in its political, economic, social, cultural, and ecological landscapes. Serious conflicts continue to arise in many regions. The threat of terrorism has become a major global concern, yet, there has not been a World War III. There was a Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. The confrontation between the US and China in recent years has been seen by some observers as the Second Cold War. Despite the buildup of arms on both sides, an all out military confrontation is not seen as inevitable. The invasion of Ukraine by Russia more recently poses a more direct and serious threat to the international system for peace. It remains to be seen how the world emerges from this conflict. In any case, the international society will face a major challenge in its quest for a new world order. Which will take in the lessons learned. The post World War II system for peace itself is under attack. The landscape of international politics is going through transformations of a game changing nature. The form of warfare itself is evolving into new dimensions, including in cyberspace, where technology and data are playing an ever increasing role. So, putting ourselves back to the viewpoint of the bird who was overseeing the last 500 years, what are we going to see happen next? Can we at most hope to make wild guesses, or will history be of any help to us? So, that concludes this lecture on the history of international politics. In my actual class, in the week following the lecture, I asked the students to participate in a mock conference of historians. Where they are each assigned a segment from the topics covered in the lecture to report on in some depth. Then, in the third week, they are asked to take part in a debate on a motion or question which is related to the subject. On this first subject, here are some questions which you may wish to ask yourself or take up in a debate. What were the causes of the great wars? Which were the more important causes? Which causes can be generalized across the different wars? Why did the previous systems for peace fail? Will there be a third world war? What has prevented a World War III up to now? 
If World War III happens, will that mean history repeats? What can we learn about the conduct of nation states through the history of wars? Can a theory of war with a universal application be constructed? Thank you for listening.